This is Pastor Mike Brun of Abba Christian Center located in Slipper Rock. We have a special treat for you coming up right now. Reverend Howard Pittman, a man that was raised from the dead, a, a man that had uh, aneurysm explode. He's dead. He, and, but while he was dead, he went face to face with Jesus. He entered in prior to his coming back to life. And Jesus raising him from the dead. Jesus showed him the spirit realm, the operation of demons, the operation of angelic hosts. It is, and he came back with an end time message that will change your life. I guarantee you his books have sold millions and we had the privilege to have him in our church. And now I want to share his testimony with you. Again, Reverend Howard Pittman, I believe that your life will be immeasurably changed. I want to tell you about a great miracle, a real miracle, a miracle that God worked in my life. Not because of me. He did it in spite of me. Because what he did for me I didn't believe he would do for anyone, let alone the worst sinner in the world. And that's what I considered myself to be. Paul said he was the worst sinner. He didn't know me, or he wouldn't have said that. <laughs> well, <clears throat> this occurred in 1979. I was in an ambulance being transferred between hospitals as a result of a massive internal hemorrhage when all my vital life signs fail and the paramedic in attendance judged me to be dead. Up until that day in my life, I had never experienced any kind of supernatural activity. I'd never heard a supernatural audible voice. I'd never seen any kind of supernatural manifestation. In fact, I did not even believe that such a thing was possible. I never thought it would happen to me. So what God did that day, he did for his reasons only, not for mine. Who knows the ways of God? Why he does things and how he does it. His ways are far above, far above our ways. <clears throat> but I think I've went over this in my mind time and time again. Why me, Lord? Why me? I think I've found an answer. I'm not sure of that. But I believe before he did it to me, he searched this world. He couldn't find a sorry human being on earth in me. <laughs> and that's why he did it. Because everybody that knew me can say he didn't do it. That's for sure. God had to do it. If it was done, God had to do it. And he did. Not because of me, but in spite of me. You know, I was raised in a very Christian family. My father founded a church in 1934. He was never a preacher. But he was a member of the church and the president of the board of deacons for 50 years. But he was never a preacher. But we lived in a wilderness, sort of, at that time. It was part of the state that had very, very few people. Our closest neighbor was two miles down the road. We never knew what was going on in his house because we didn't have a telephone to call him up with. Even if we'd had one, he wouldn't have had one to answer us with. <laughs> Country people didn't have telephone. We didn't even have electricity. Electricity never came to that part of the state of Mississippi until 1940. Up until that time, my mama cooked on a wood-burning stove three meals a day to feed 10 hungry mouths. And it all came through. It started the day I was born, November the 24th, 1928. Next week will be 49 years I've been breathing if I'm living next week. 89 years, excuse me. <laughs> See how that senior moment took over? <laughs> That's happening quite often nowadays. It sort of happened today a little bit. I lost my glasses, see? And somebody found them this evening, so. so you might say that's a small miracle. 
But I think all, all miracles are great. No matter what, how little they appear to be on the surface, they're all great. Living in that <coughs> rural community, we didn't go anywhere during the week. No one come to see us. I think in the entire community, we had one old Model A Ford somebody had. We didn't have it. We went to church after the church was founded. We went to church in a wagon pulled by a mule or a buggy pulled by a horse, whatever it was. Or we walked. But we got there because my father had an unwritten rule. His rule was very short. If you put your feet under his table, you go to church. No question that. <laughs> and I went to church every time that church door opened. And nobody ever asked me if I wanted to go. <laughs> I knew I had to go. That was his rule. I had to go. Well, <clears throat> we had an unwritten rule in our church. We, we, we uh, got there about two hours earlier every Sunday. That's so the little boys could go down the woods and play. Little girls would go around the back and play. And the adults would go meet up front and continue their gossip for the week, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way it was growing up. I remember... <clears throat> suffering through some of the longest sermons I ever heard in my life. <laughs> Our pastor, when I was a little boy, had a great big old railroad watch. And when he'd get up there, he'd take that watch out and lay it down right there and look at it. I never did know why, because he never looked at it again. <laughs> <clears throat> and it seemed like there was no end ever to the way it would come. Well, when we got there, all of us little boys would go down in the woods to play. And we would stay down there until it was time to come in. And when it was time to come in, they'd ring an old cowbell. We didn't have a church bell. We had a cowbell. And we'd all come in. <clears throat> now, during that church building there in the 30s, we didn't have any money. Money was something that didn't go to Mississippi. <laughs> uh, folks down there, whatever you got, you bartered for it. You traded you trade. didn't have no money. My, my, my sister, my baby sister, not long ago wrote a book. And she did the research from the old papers of the church about the meeting. 1933, uh, I believe it was. No, the church was built in 34, 36. 1936, the average Sunday offering was three cents. That was the kind of money we didn't have. But the floor in front of Austin was filled with chickens, eggs, butter, honey. Well, that's how the people paid the pastor. They, he was the traveling minister, the pastor was. And he came in an old car, and he'd get that stuff and take it to the store, and he'd swap for gasoline or whatever else he needed. And that's how we fared during that time. My mama, <clears throat> now she was very, very much in charge of what, on, what went on as far as the children was concerned in that church. And when they rang that bell, she made sure I was in that church. Before she sat down, she made sure I was there. So I knew where I had to be. And I took my favorite seat. I don't know if you ever had a favorite church, church but I did. Mine was on the back door, right by the back door, <laughs> just as far away from the front as I could get. One of the reasons was my mama sat on the front row, and she had the best ears in that church. I can never remain, remember in my life my mama turning her head and looking back. She never had to do that. Oh, stick that hand up and wiggle that finger. <laughs> and that made a whipping when you get home. And when my mama said whipping, you better believe she meant what she said. When she said frogs, you jump. That's the way it was with her. Now, my daddy, he had a heart so small, so any tear would melt his heart. We knew how to handle him. 
but there wasn't no way of handling mama. Because when she whipped you, you know you've been whipped. Because <laughs> she whipped you. That church, they built it out of loblolly pines. You don't know what a loblolly pine is? The pine section of the United States starts in East Texas, comes across East Texas, all the way across North Louisiana, up into Arkansas, all the way across Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, part of North Florida, and uh, part of the Carolinas, both of the Carolinas. That's the pine forest. In the pine forest in the old days was the loblolly pine. The loblolly pine was the most precious pine tree to the lumbermen. It didn't grow very tall. It was sort of stubby, but it got big. And that's what the lumbermen like, because it made plenty of lumber, plenty of lumber. And it was the hardest pine lumber made. The older it got, the harder it got, like cement. So some rich folks over in, your neighbor over in New York organized what they call the Great Southern Lumber Company. That put Southern on that so it fooled the people where they're going. <laughs> they or organized the Great Southern Lumber Company and went to the went to the Pine Forest across the South, and they bought all of that virgin timber to, timber timber from the railroad and the government. The railroad and government owned all that. So they bought it all, and uh, they went, they was after the loblolly pine trees. That's what they wanted. They wanted the loblolly pine. So every section, as they moved through the pine belt, they would move the sawmill to bring the lumber. And if you look at some of those old stately mansions over in New York City that's built out of lumber, you look and see the loblolly pine. That is the hardest wood in the world at loblolly pine trees. Well, when they built our church, that's what we built it out of, loblolly pines. They cut the pines down, carried them to the local sawmill, had them cut up one, five, uh, one, one by four boards, and brought them back, nailed them together with a hammer and nail. That was the pews you sit on. <laughs> loblolly pine, the hardest wood in the world. <laughs> And the older it got, the harder it got. <laughs> I guarantee you there was not a single spot in that church where you could go to sleep. <laughs> First place the preacher preached too loud, he'd wake up anybody. Well, <clears throat> it was torture for me to have to sit in that church because I knew the preacher was telling me the truth. My daddy read the Bible every night. I know those people he read about were real. I know they were real people. I knew that. But they were all dead. They'd been dead for a hundred years. That's all that preacher wanted to talk about, dead folks. Dead folks, you know. So it was really, it was really tough for me to have to sit through that. Every Sunday he's talking about them dead folks. They'd been dead for hundreds of years, thousands of years. I knew they'd been real folks, but they were, to me, they were no more real than the folks that's out in the cemetery. They were dead too. They'd been real people at one time. So, little boy, that just, I just couldn't, I couldn't, couldn't understand that. I couldn't believe it. It was torture for I had to sit there and listen to it because I knew what he was going to preach on. So my, most times, I would I'd try to lock him out altogether. I wouldn't hear a word he'd say. I'm sitting there looking straight ahead just like I'm paying attention. I knew if my mama called me looking one way or the other, she'd get me. So I looked ahead. But my mind wasn't on it. My mind was over those hills and valleys, wondering how long it was going to be before we could get out of that church. I thought I was going to starve to death anyway. <laughs> so, that's the way it worked. <clears throat> One day we had an old itinerant preacher come into church. And he started preaching. I wasn't paying any attention to him. I thought he was going to do the same thing. But he didn't. Suddenly I heard a word that he said. I'd never heard that word before. So I collected my mind and I tuned in on him. When I told, tuned in on him, he was talking about something I'd never heard of before. He was talking about a 
place called hell. And the longer he talked, the more he painted for me a picture with his words of a place of everlasting punishment. Now, he got my attention. He had my attention. When a 12-year-old boy hears punishment, he pays attention to that, you see. <laughs> so I was paying attention to that. I listened to that preacher, and I said, man, could this be true? Could this be real? I don't want any part of this. Whatever it is, if it's true, I don't want any part of it. I'll do anything I got to do as long as I don't have any part of this. When he got through preaching, <clears throat> he gave an invitation. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was the first one that came. I didn't walk, I ran. Right up to that altar in the hurry. I wanted to miss whatever it was he was talking about. I didn't know what it was he was talking about. I sure didn't want any of it, though. I didn't want any of it. Twelve years old, I gave my life to this God my father loved so very much. I must confess, at the time I didn't know this God, but I knew my father. Besides being my father, he was my very best friend. I wanted to please him with my life. Besides, that preacher literally scared it out of me. So, <laughs> I really didn't want any part of what it was he was giving away there. I wasn't interested in receiving any of it. So I made my commitment at 12 years old. Well, you know how time has a way of changing things. In time, electricity came to the county. When it came, we tore down the old log cabin. We built a new and modern brick building. But basically, the fellowship remained the same country folk they'd always been. I remember going to that church little church as a young adult, barely out of my teens, telling those people that God had called me to be a preacher. Well, they took me out of my word. They licensed me to preach the gospel. So I went away and enrolled in college in preparation to ministry, the most difficult undertaking of my entire life. I'd been out of school a long time. I didn't realize how tough it was going to be to go back to school. But I tell you, <clears throat> I finally wrestled with it over there. Said, well, if this is what it's like to be a preacher, I want to be a preacher, so I'll, I'll stick it out. I stuck it out for two years. Then I decided I'd enjoyed all that sacrifice I could stand. <laughs> so I quit, left school, went to the city of New Orleans, country boy going to town. Got down there, I started a career that was going to last me for 26 years. I served with the New Orleans Police Department, the Louisiana State Police Department, and on detached service with the Baltimore, Maryland Police Department, serving every level of law enforcement from the uniformed officer on the beat throughout the ranks and chain of command. At the same time, I continued to practice my Christian faith. They allowed me to continue my Christian education. So I rolled in the seminary and finished my education in the seminary. Same time I was working on the police department. Same time I pastored a church for a solid year while working on the police department at night, on the police department, in, in a, uh, uh, at night and on the, wherever I could find at night. I carried a little portable PA system and in the trunk of my car. And on Saturdays, uh, when I found myself off duty, I would travel around to the little towns and villages surrounding the city of New Orleans, where it was not against the law to preach in the court square, set up my vehicle and preach in the court square. Later on, my wife and I started a ministry in our own home. We opened our home to abused, misused, neglected, and thrown away children. We took 32 children into our home. They ranged anywhere from, from uh, 18 months to 16 years. It was the ministry of the children that opened my eyes to what I needed. When I saw the abuse, the misuse, the terrible things that those kids had to go through, 
And I realized that every one of them was crying for help. And I couldn't help them. I didn't know what they needed. What they needed was what I had lacking, information about the enemy. And God was going to give me a first class education about the enemy. That's when I, he started talking to me. He talked to me in what I call letters. God wrote letters by voice. He does that, you know. I bet you hadn't received one from him lately, have you? Because you probably don't have your mailbox posted for it, <laughs> do you? Now, when I <laughs> see he, God has a way of using things that every individual is very familiar with. You've got to be very familiar with whatever God's going to use in your life. You've got to be familiar with it. And he knew when I went to school, first went to school, as a little tiny fella, we didn't have uh, what they got nowadays. We had what they call primer. Mm -hmm. That was the first entrance when you went to primer. Well, uh, they taught me how to read with pictures. This is how God writes letters. We call them dreams. We call them dreams, but they're pictures. Everyone is a message when he sends out. This Bible contains 250 of those messages. Have you ever read him? You ever read this Bible? Then you ought to know that God talks through dreams. He talks through dreams. You ought to know it. 250 verses of Scripture refers to his talking through dreams to people. This Bible says God is the same today he was yesterday. He will be tomorrow. He was when this earth did not even exist. He was the same God he is today. He will be when it starts raining fire. When it starts raining fire. And that's the next big movement when the fire starts coming. And it's going to come. It's going to come. You see, for 1,500 years, water never fall out, fell out of the sky. 1,500 years, God watered the earth for the dew of the ground. People lived on this earth for 15 years, never saw water fall out of the sky. And one day it did. It fell out of the sky. People couldn't believe that. That don't happen. That's against nature. It's going to rain fire. It's going to rain fire one day. People don't believe that either. It's against nature. But watch. You'll remember when you see the first fireball come. You'll remember that it's coming. Just like the rain came. It's coming. Well, <clears throat> he started talking to me in picture letters in 1973. I hope in next meeting we're going to get the chance to talk about some of them letters that he sent me. Because in some of my books, I wrote about some of the things he told was going to happen. In 1984, I published them. You can get that book today and read what I said was going to happen in 84, and it just happened. Amen. It just happened this past year. The very thing that God said was going to happen. Hallelujah. What happened that was so earth-shaking last year? He told me it was going to happen. He told it to me. In 1973, that's how long ago it was he told me it was going to happen. And I wrote about it in my book. He told me an unbelievable election was going to occur, where an unbelievable individual was going to be elected the president of the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. 1973, he told me that was going to happen. And I wrote about it. You want to read that? <laughs> Amazon sells that book today for $5. It's called Placebo. Just order it from Amazon. Or you can order it from me. I wrote about it in 1984. So you can't say I made up after the election. I didn't even know the man's name. 
I didn't know the man's name. God didn't tell me the man's name. He just showed me a picture of him. Amazing, huh? Amazing, isn't it? Read the book and you'll see how amazing it really is. How amazing it really is. God's an amazing God. See, he had his hand in it. People say, well, why would he use a man like that? Who knows why he would? What did he say about uh, his servant, Nebuchadnezzar, the most evil man that ever lived? He said, behold, my servant, Nebuchadnezzar, the most evil, evil man that ever lived. God can use anybody. Amen. You don't have to have their heart. He can use anybody. And he has throughout history. Read this book. And look at the no count people that he used to work great works throughout life. You don't question what God does. Anyway, that's some of the things he wrote about. But then he showed me an enemy that we have to deal with. And he showed me what the little children were hurting for. What happened to them? Well, 1979, the first one of those letters that he wrote me came from. See, I had those letters for seven years. I recorded every one of them on the tape recorder. I played them before my church. I played them to anybody that listened to them. I asked everybody I could find to give me an interpretation. Nobody could give me an interpretation, anything. All those five letters. He sent me five letters. Every one of them had a prediction it was going to take seven years for it to occur. So 1979, the first one happened when I was pronounced dead by, by a paramedic in an ambulance on the way between the hospitals. Amazing. I crossed the veil of darkness so fast. There's no way that I can describe what it was like when I crossed that veil of darkness. It was 19 miles from the hospital when the machine says, all oh, my vital life signs fail. The paramedic picked up the radio. My wife was in the ambulance with me. He picked up the radio. He called the hospital. He said, he said the patient has died. All the vital life signs have failed. Prepare the emergency room. Have a physician meet us on the ramp. Thirteen minutes later, our ambulance pulled into the Southwest Regional Medi Medical Center at Macomb, Mississippi. Dr. Sidney Ross, head of surgery, was standing on that ramp. As they took my body out of that ambulance, he had a razor blade in his hand. He cut my chest open outside the hospital on that ramp and began to infuse blood directly into one of the main veins. Fifteen minutes later, they had me in the emergency room where seven doctors worked on this body from 4 p.m. till 12 midnight, trying to preserve whatever spark of life was in this body. They very quickly restored my vital life signs, but they could never get them equalized. They were trying to get them equalized. Finally, about midnight, they thought they had them down enough that they could put me in the ICU. So they put me in the ICU. But Dr. Ross and his assistant continued to work on me throughout the wee hours of the morning. At 6 a.m. Saturday morning, this was on Friday, August the 3rd, 1979, when I left one hospital to go to the other one because my vital life signs was failing at the hospital. That's why they transferred me. Well, Dr. Ross and his assistant spent the entire night working on me. So wherever I go to give this testimony, I try to include that part as a testimony to the dedication of those medical people. I praise God for that kind of dedication. Very few people have it today, but he did. And I thank God for him. He stayed with me from that Friday afternoon. He worked on me till 6 o'clock Saturday morning. And then... They had to, he come out and told my wife, who was in the waiting room, I've done everything I can. It's between God and him now. 
She said, you can't stop now. I heard you talking to one of the doctors, and you said they changed, changed it for surgery. I said, yes, I need to do the surgery, but I, I won't be honest with you. I don't think he can withstand the trauma. I believe it'd kill him. She said, if you can do, if you think there's a chance, do it. He did. He went back in that room here, and, this, and they operated on me all day Saturday and come out at 4 o'clock Saturday afternoon. He'd been there since Friday. He was there to 4 o'clock Saturday afternoon. I thank God for him. Oh, every person that worked on me during that. Back there in that ambulance when the lights went out. In other words, when I crossed the veil. <clears throat> the Bible talks about the veil as the valley of the shadow of death. The veil is not in this world. Neither is it in the world to come. It's the door between the two. You will go through it no matter what you think, whether you believe it or not. You will pass through it. You will go through the veil. As I went in this place, I had never experienced such darkness. See the color back there? That's light compared to what I, the darkness was. It was choking. That's how dark it was in there. No light, nothing, absolutely nothing. I felt abandoned, forsaken, all alone in a, a place that I didn't know where it was or what it was or where I was at. I was on the edge of eternity where I was. The first thing I heard was a voice, an audible voice. That was the sweetest voice. Ever. It was like music. And it was totally hypnotic, compelling, as the voice says, stop. Stop. No more pain. Don't breathe. Don't breathe. Just stop. Be still. Be quiet. God was telling me to stop breathing. God was telling me to stop breathing. He was talking to me. Everything, every breath that I get, I had to bring by every ounce of strength I could muster to get the breath out. And I'm trying to find the strength to stop breathing. Because I was thinking God was telling me to stop breathing. And all of a sudden, the realize hit me, realization hit me. This is not God. I just asked God to extend my life. Amen. But don't breathe. I'm going to die. You are not God. When I screamed, that Satan left from me. Amen. There in the valley, veil, at the valley of death, he lied to me. He tried to get me to kill myself. He couldn't kill me. He had to get me to kill myself. This is how he works. Through his wiles, his tricks, his deceit. That's his only weapon. That's his only weapon. When I resisted the devil, he fled from me. Instantly, the angels were all around me. They had been there all the time, but they never revealed their presence. They didn't reveal their presence till I resisted the devil. I had to resist the devil on my own first. And when I did, when I did, they appeared. They were there all the time with me, and I didn't know they were there. Instantly, when, I, when the devil fled and I saw the angels, they took my spirit out of, by the, out of my body, out of darkness into light. We crossed the veil. We were on the other side, the other side of the veil. As we walked through that veil or, or traveled through that veil, I don't think we walked because instantly I was over there, instantly, just like that fast, when they took me over there. The first thing I saw is that beautiful light that bathed me in that beautiful light. The first thing I saw was a living verse of Scripture being acted out before my eyes like a stage play with all the characters. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. 
They was acting it out for me right before my eyes. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. I want to read that verse of Scripture to you because I want to tell you something. This was what I needed to know. This is what my pastor never talked me, talk, talk to me about at all. Spiritual war. We're in war. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, plural, against powers, plural, against the rulers, plural, of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. A spiritual government, a spiritual government made up of many so many of these numberless beings. You see, the enemy is one individual, just like you and I. If he's in this room tonight, he's not out in the world. If he's out in the world, he's not in this ring. He can't be in but one place at one time, just like you and I. But you see, God is everywhere at the same time. But Satan is not. He is not. So he mounted a credible attack against God's plan. In order to do that, he had to find a play, a way to make himself omnipresent. So he's omnipresent here tonight. How did he do that? Since he's a single spirit just like you and I. He did that through the delegation of power. He delegates his authority to demon spirits. You have one with you tonight. If you belong to God and you're in a lot of trouble to the devil, you might have a dozen with you. I don't know. But you're never alone. You're never alone. You have an angel too assigned to you if you belong to God. Or if you potentially belong to God, you have an angel along with that demon. That angel has one purpose in mind, one purpose only, not to protect you. He's there to ensure that your will is not violated. If you willfully let him in, he'll let him do it. So you hold it in your hand, what you're going to do. He made you with a free, sovereign will. You're going to choose to do what you want to do. And because you and you alone make the choice, you alone and you alone will give account for the choice that you make. That's what's very important for you to know. That's what I read to you about in the first part, in the seventh chapter of Matthew, when he's talking about his church. That's what I was reading about. It's coming a time and place where you're going to give him a chance for, a choice, you're going to give an answer for every second of that time you've wasted. You've wasted. Now, what does he say? Because we're all human, we all make mistakes, we're all in trouble, aren't we? How do we erase that? Repent. Amen. Repent. Amen. God is just and faithful to forgive. He said this is why the Pharisee could not be saved, because he refused to repent. Repentance is the best thing. Every day I have to repent. Oh, I do. I repented for losing my glasses today. Because I did it. It was my fault. So I had to repent for it. It means take better care of what God gave me. A lot of times I have to repent for not taking better care of what God gave me. You know, sometimes I get caught up in this world out here. I have to repent for that. I have to repent for that. Sometimes it, I'm supposed to give him 100% of my time. You know the Muslims do. 100% of their time is dedicated to their religion. And they are all worshiping the wrong God. Amen. They're worshiping the wrong God. But they're doing it 100% of their time. 100% of their time. Their God is first in everything where our God ought to be. 
where our God ought to be. Because every breath you breathe, he gave it to you. He gave it to you. And what is immutable mercy? Because if we had our just desserts, we'd all be dead in hell. But he's merciful to us. He is merciful to us. As I saw this council operating, let me show you how it works. Look at these enemies. What did he say? He says, for we wrestle. Now, why did they use that term? Why did they use the term wrestle? You ever thought of that? That's a sporting event. There's nothing sporting about our enemy. He is the most diabolical adversary we'll ever encounter. Nothing sporting about him. Not a sporting ounce of blood in him at all. Nowhere. Yet that's the term they used. Why? Because the definition in every language on earth for wrestle is the same thing. What does it mean? Contact contest. Contact contest. That's what wrestle means. In every language on earth, when you wrestle, you have a contact contest. You can get two fighters in the ring boxing one another. They don't even have to touch one. They, talk, they box according to the clock. But wrestle got touch before it counts in the wrestle match. It's con contact contest, wrestling there. And that's what they use that. So that's what we're involved in. He's going to touch us. We're in a contact contest. Now, <clears throat> maybe he hadn't touched you lately, but he will. He will. Maybe he has. Maybe he touched you. You didn't even know he was there. You've probably been in a fight with him, and he chewed you up and spit you out, and you didn't even know you was in a fight. <laughs> Most probably that's what happened, you see. You didn't even know you was in a fight. But that's how he works. Uh -huh. How does he get away with this? Because... We call it anonymity. What did he say? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not the church down the road we're against. Not the one over the next hill we're against. No. It's not even the robber who's trying to steal from us or the murderer's trying to kill us. That's not really our enemy. See, the enemy is behind the one who tries to kill us. It's the enemy that put him there. That's how he works. That's who we've got to fight. We've got to learn to fight. And there's a winning way. We're going to talk about that, I hope, in our next meeting, how we can beat him, how we can beat him. As I watch this work, I look. He says, we wrestle against what? Not flesh and blood, but what do we wrestle against? Why? He says, we wrestle against principalities. What is a principality? Why, why did they call uh, Prince Rainer the ruler of a principality? Because any prince that rules, he declared whatever he rules is a principality. Whatever a prince rules over is a principality. So, this is a territory. In America, are more territories the devil has to contend with than the rest of the world put together. America is the sore spot. And this is why the enemy set out all out attack on this America. I'm going to show you how, what the end result of that attack is going to be. Unless... You learn how to beat him. You call a war. Did you know that? No, you don't know it, but you are. You call a war. Now, let's see. When all these people start talking about conspiracies, we shake our head, don't we? Well, the Bible talks about one. I bet you we won't shake our head when I read it to you. The last great conspiracy. The Bible talks about it. We're going to read it if I get to Psalms. My Bible has Psalms in it. I know I don't buy a Bible without Psalms. <laughs> so, oh, oh, yes. Yeah, so 
we'll just go to some. I want to read about this. Last great conspiracy. It's found in Psalms chapter 1. Psalms. In the book of Psalms. Uh, excuse me. Psalms beginning in verse, verse 1, chapter 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. The rulers of the world are against you and they taking counsel against you. That's the last great conspiracy. We see it coming to the surface now because you are terrible in their eyes. In their eyes, you are terrible. You're a bigot. You're a racist. you everything that they can think of that's terrible. In their eyes, they really believe that. That's why they hate you. They hate you. They want to destroy you. They want to destroy the Christians because they literally hate you because they really and truly believe that. They believe you're bad, that you don't know anything, that you're an idiot. All this stuff they believe. They really believe it. And you see it today like you've never seen it before in your life. Never seen it before like you're seeing it today. They're determined to do away with you. They're determined to do it. And... They're succeeding by the thousands, by the thousands. God gave you 120 years. How many of you think you're going to make it? Are you going to let the devil kill you? Because he's trying what he's trying to do. But he can't kill you against your will. You didn't know that. But you have to prove to him he can't be. You got to prove to him you got the will. You got to prove it to him. Or he's going to try to kill you. He's stealing from you every day. Every day, he's stealing from you hours, minutes, seconds, days, months, and years. Go by the cemetery where they're burying a Christian. Look at the day, how long they lived. See how many you can find lived 120 years. Let's go see. He gave you 120 years, but he required you to do something to protect it. He required you to live a clean life, yes, Lord. eat healthy food, yes, Lord. do what you're supposed to do to protect your body. You're given that authority. You're given that okay to do it. We don't like to do that. The best word we know is no. <laughs> no, 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 no. How many times we said to the kids? How many times we said to them, no, 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 no. That's the best word we got, no. We don't want to do it. We don't want to do it. That's part of the fight. We have to learn how to say no to the right one, right one. Well, we look at this principality. Let's create a hypothetical principality so you can see how it works. Let's say this fellowship is a hypothetical principality. It may very well be a real principality. But each principality has a prince to rule over it. He's way up there. As I saw him at the round, they let me see him at the table. He sits at the table. He sits at the head of the table. And it's around that table is his demon princes, his princes, who are charged with the responsibility of carrying out his plan. That's how he made himself omnipresent. Each one of them, then, is given your name. Each one is given the the name of an just one single individual in that principality. And he's told, take as many demons as you need to do it. Put out that light. Get that light put out. See, that's what he's afraid of, your light. Not your words, your light. That's what he's afraid of. You got a light. 
You are the light of the world if you work for the Lord. You got a light. And that's what the enemy wants to put out, that light. But he's got to get you a corporation. He's got to get you a corporation to put out that light. So he's got all kind of plans set up. One of the greatest plans that works the most effectively that he has, and I'm going to tell you about, they let me see this plan at work. It's called, similar to the drowning syndrome. He wants to drown you as an individual, not in water, but in problems, in problems. He wants to keep as many problems in your life as he can create and stir up. That takes all your time. It's like trying to hold your nose above water while you're drowning. You can't help anybody. You can't do any work for work. You can't shine your light for the world to see. You're too busy trying to hold yourself above the water. That's his most effective individual plan. He tries to drown your light. That's what he tries to do. We have to learn how to shine that light anyway. We shine that light by the light we live, by the life that we live. It's the greatest sermon you'll ever preach. It's the life that you live. And somebody is watching you the whole time. See, now what he wants to do, he wants you to compromise with the world. Every time you compromise, he smudges your chimney of your light just a little. He's taking a little bit of light away from you. That's all right. He's very patient. He'll work hundreds of years to get that light out if he gets smudged enough. So every time you fail, every time you compromise, every time you give in to him, you're losing a little of your light. And that's the way he goes. If he can get that light out, he's got you. He's got you. You just got to get out. You're no threat to him. When you're no threat to him, you're no asset to God. Remember that. You're in what the world would call between a rock and a hard place. That's where you find yourself, between a rock and a hard place. See, this is war. What did Paul say? Listen carefully. Through much tribulation, we enter into the kingdom of God. Know that. That's what that tribulation is. For you fighting to hold that light and him fighting to put it out. Through much tribulation, we enter into the kingdom of God. Don't think that God has deserted you. Paul said rejoice. Rejoice when he does that. Because you know you got a light. When that enemy tries to put it out, you got a light. Rejoice. <laughs> you find that's hard to do, don't you? Yeah. I, I do. I, I find it's hard to do. Oh, so many times, Lord, why don't you give me an easy sermon? But he hasn't given me an easy sermon. He's never given me... You know, and, and, and the thing about it, so many times I want to go to Florida, so he sends me there in the summer. <laughs> he sends me to Pennsylvania in the winter. <laughs> Never where I want to go, but where he wants me to go. That's what, you, that's what we have to do. That's how, that's how the enemy he worked with. Well, after we left the... the um, when I saw this, this is a council, a governmental council, a spiritual government council there that I just read, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. It's this uh, spiritual government that enemy has where he was able to delegate his authority to the individual spirit. So the demon spirits in you are not the devil himself, but Jesus refers to him as devil. When he was walking along the sidewalk and, and he was talking about he was talking about he was going to have to suffer. He was going to have to die. He was going to have... Peter right away tried to discourage him, you know. He turned around, looked at Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. That wasn't Peter talking. Have you ever said a word? You wonder where it came from? Now you know. Now you know where it came from because that devil talks through it when you try to justify your failure. That's the devil talking. He's trying to convince you. 
And it's justification on your part. Well, when we left that, when we left that, the next place he brings me to see, all the time I'm saying, see, I knew where I was. I knew where I was. And I knew I had crossed the veil. And I knew flesh and blood cannot cross the veil. I knew that. So I'm sitting saying to myself, is he going to leave me here? Because if he leaves me here, I'm, I'm, I ain't coming back. He's got to bring me back. If I come back, he's got to put me back across the veil. Because I'm a spirit now on that side. And flesh and blood can't cross the veil. So the spirit's got to do that. So I'm saying, I'm thinking this all the time. And I'm wondering who this choking feeling I'm getting. It seems like I'm smothering, trying to smother me. And I know I'm in spirit. I'm not in the flesh, but it's it just the smothering feeling. And I wonder what it's about. You see, that's when I learned they can read your mind. Because the angel just called me and said, this thing that you're talking about, you're thinking about why that feeling is so bad. You're in a world where there's no love, no love at all. Think of that. Satan's kingdom is no love. They serve him out of fear. He has a police force that enforces. They enforce it, what they have to do. They dare not challenge him. They dare not challenge him. You want to see how powerful he was? Read the little book of Jude. When Moses went to the, when Moses was buried in the hill and the and uh, the archangel was sent to preserve his body. There was Satan trying to steal Moses' body. The archangel, that means the top. He was there. He was trying to steal Moses. What, what did he want with Moses' body? I don't know. The Bible don't say what he wants with it. But he was trying to take it. And the archangel said to him, the Lord rebuke you. He wouldn't rebuke the devil. The archangel, he said, the Lord rebuke you. That tells you a little bit about his power. Want to know a little bit more about his power? He was able to deceive one-third of the angels of heaven. That's saying something because they don't have a dummy in the angel court. And he, he deceived one-third of them to join him in open rebellion. That tells you a little bit about his power. Think about that. I could tell you a lot more about it, but time doesn't permit now. I got off my sermon. I'm starting to teaching instead of preaching. I go back to it. Well, we're going, the next place we go to was this tunnel. This beautiful tunnel that runs right through the sky. I'm looking at that tunnel. On either side, in the center of this tunnel, is a highway, a brilliant highway, lined on either side with the most.